Let's talk about creating a space for difficult, complicated, important conversations. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I am James Milan, and I want to in, uh, welcome you to this inaugural episode of a new series that we are doing, which goes by the working title of Let's Talk About. And it is basically to create a safe space here to, t to have mm, potentially difficult, important for sure, challenging, complicated conversations. And I want to uh, thank my first guest, my colleague, Joanne Clinton, for being brave enough to come out here knowing that that's what's going to happen. Uh, and today we are going to spend the time talking about um, Joanne's journey. And it is not, you know, that's, a, that's, that's an overused word, but it's appropriate in this case. Jo yes, Joanne's journey from her childhood in Worcester then via Rhode Island and many years spent in the city of Boston and then out to Arlington in a very deliberate decision which she will describe to us uh, in greater detail. But anyway, most importantly, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you. Me. I appreciate it. Yeah. So what we want to do is what we want to talk about today. I said difficult, challenging, etc. Uh, we're going to talk about race, identity, and how that has played out in your life and the tough decisions that you have made for yourself, especially recently, uh, around these things. Yes. But let's start, if we can, if, you, if, you, if uh, okay with you, let's start with your childhood. All right. That's uh, a fun place to begin. Yeah. And so yes. I, I understand that, uh, well, you've told me before that you grew up in Worcester and in a particular kind of uh, neighborhood in, in Worcester. So just tell us about that. Well, um, I, was, I grew up in Worcester during the 70s and early 80s. I was actually born in Worcester. And at that time, Worcester was predominantly white, but it was multicultural. I call it multicultural admixture, where uh, I went to elementary school. Yes, most of, the, most of the, my, my schoolmates, they were white. But also, you know, the, the, the children of color included um, children from Southeast Asia, um, African American, um, the, the Caribbean, um, in the Puerto Rican and Dominican d d descent. And um, it wasn't unusual to, and also, and also even people from Europe who were newly immigrants, mm -hmm. because I, I had an ear for um, accents growing up because I heard them. I heard the, um, I didn't know what it was called then, but it was the Gaelic accent. I heard that. Um, I heard some, like, you know, even some Mediterranean accents, the, the Greek. And, hmm. um, and also I've heard, I heard, like, the difference between, even now if I pay attention, I can tell a difference between, I don't understand all the words, the accent between someone who's Dominican versus someone who's Puerto Rican. Ooh, very good. You know, because I grew up listening to all of this, mm -hmm. you know, listening to the music. I, I, could, I, I don't dance anymore, but I, I, did, I did attend the first birthdays. And I did attend, um, you know, I was invited to weddings and, and things like that. And I know how to salsa and merengue. <laughs> and I, and, I'm not, and I, I know what jerk chicken is. And I also know how to use chopsticks, you know. And um, so all these things were not unfamiliar to me. And, and at the same time, I identified as, you know, someone who's, who's black. But not excluding the fact that my mother is a Native American in Portuguese descent. Mm -hmm. And it was okay to identify yourself and say, yeah, I'm black. And my mom says, oh, yeah, my mom's. You know, so and so mm -hmm. and so. Yeah, oh, my mom, my mom's, my mom's black too. But, oh, but my mom's white. So it, it wasn't a big deal. It was just who we were. Yeah. So it sounds like, I mean, in identity terms, it sounds like at that time, growing up for you, you were aware of your blackness, yes. but it was not the central issue. It wasn't the central part no. of your identity in any way. It was just another factor like just like somebody else's factor was they liked jerk chicken to eat the most or, or something yes, like yes, that. Yes, 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 yes. And, and as, as we, we talked before coming on air and um, the term of someone called, being called a morena, 
it wasn't derogatory. It was just a description of to point out someone you didn't know who that what their name was, and like someone asked, you know, where's your friend? Which friend? The Morena. They're talking about the one of a, a particular skin tone to identify them uh, out from somebody from someone else. This is a matter of acknowledging them, not to be derogatory or diminutive or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Right. So it didn't have any negative, no, no, negative no, connotations no. to call somebody a Morena. It was simply like that was a way that could help somebody recognize it when they when when yes. that person came along. Yes. Yes. And 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 I I, I still. I lo at one time, I could carry on a conversation in Spanish, but as you know, if you don't use the language, you, you lose it. But I, can st I still understand quite a bit. So I have to say that, well, first of all, I will just uh, also let the audience know from my own personal experience, yeah, you do understand quite a bit. <laughs> and your Spanish is quite good and your accent is good. And it all comes from a childhood that you were just describing, which really sounds very rich. Yes. in certain ways, yes. you know, culturally, yes. um, just in terms of like the, the exposure that you would have without having to leave your neighborhood, you would have, as you've already described, you were exposed to a lot of different uh, ways of seeing the world, ways of moving mm -hmm. through the world, etc. Yes. And yes. so how, did, how, how and when did that change? Um, well, my family moved to Providence in 1984. And I moved to a, a, a predominantly black area in Providence. And uh, I was closer to the school, which was good, only a few blocks away from my house to go to walk to school. And it was, it was, there was diversity, but it was more quote unquote African American. There was, you know, the Portuguese and Italian and, and Latino. But where I lived, the, the blocks that I lived on, the neighborhood that I lived in was predominantly was predominantly black. And because people can tell when you're not, when you're from out of town, the way I dressed, the way I spoke, the things I spoke about, um, the things that I, I the, the music I enjoyed listening to, they're like, oh, what? you're weird. You're like a wannabe. What? Why, do you, why do you talk like that? Why do you sound like that? And I'm like, I didn't understand what people were, were trying to impress upon me because I'm like, I'm speaking English properly so you can understand what I'm saying. I don't use much slang. I never, I never did. Um, I don't use profanity because it wasn't allowed in my house. And even to this day, I, I don't, I don't do, I don't do that either. And I never got into um, smoking marijuana, you know, all praise to Allah. And, and it, or the, or the drug culture. So I was always looked at as What's up with her? Mm. Is that when it started? Because it sounds like in Worcester, you wouldn't have had that feeling of yes. being kind of outside of the mainstream of whatever's right around you. But interestingly enough, right, you moved to a predominantly black community in, mm -hmm. in Rhode Island, and that's when you started to feel that way. Yes, and at the time that I moved, it was like the, the, I was just turning 16. So com moving away from being a child to, to finding your, your social you know, equals and, 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 and making those connections into your adulthood, like coming of age. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it was like, I felt a little, you know, stunted, like, well, who, and, you know, strange, not strangely enough, but true to my, my background, I made very good friends um, in the high school that I, that I went to in, in Providence with a, with a girl, her name's Maria, and she's Dominican. And we were so close that some people thought we were sisters. Mm -hmm. We had the same skin complexion, mm -hmm. and we sniggled and laughed and talked, and, and, so, and we would even went on to um, community college together, went on to community college together. And, um, and, you know, people would see it, they're like, are you guys sisters? And we're like, yeah, we just have different mothers, but we're sisters. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, what, what, what does that, I mean, I don't know. Just t tell 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 us what that felt like to to, or as you look back on it, because probably at that time you just were, you know, you were just waking up and getting through every day, and Maria was who you li li liked to be with, and so spent a lot of time with her. As you look back on it, I guess, uh, is there anything revealing in that, in the fact that you gravitated towards a friendship with somebody who, again, reminded you more of your time? When yeah, you were Worcester. in Worcester oh, yes. than, than yes. in your new home. I, 
it because it, it wasn't about the skin color or the race. It's about what we wanted to, what we had in mind to do. You know, I I wanted I wanted to go I wanted to go to college after after high school, and she was a year behind me, and um, she did too. And um, I, I started working right after high school because, you know, you got to support yourself. You know, nobody has, nobody in, the, in our neighborhood had like tons and tons of money. And most, most women or girls became like 17, 18, 19 years old. You went and got a job because you want, you want your clothes, you want to take care of yourself. And um, no one's going to, at, at, at 18, it's like, you got to start doing more for yourself and start thinking about moving on. So like, I want to go to college. So, um. I went. I went to. I went to CCRI, and a year later, I was so happy that, you know, Maria graduated, and we started going together, and um, and it was it was four of us. It was me, Maria, a girl named Wanda, and another girl named Kelly, and it was me, quote unquote, the African American, two Latinos, and one and one white white girl. And she and um, Kelly, she was like a Barbie doll. She was like Fair right. so she looked. Kelly was just like what I would imagine, like blonde she, and yes. You know. But she was like a lot of fun and um, easy to talk to. And those years were really I'm gonna stop crying. Those years, those college years, um, were really I really had a good time um, getting 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 through those years. And um, then I had my daughter, and um, I went. I started working, and. And Maria, she she got married and she moved away. And of all her friends, she always she always commented me. I was the one that encouraged her to go. Mm. I said, "That's what you're supposed to do." You you know what I'm saying? Because what is what is here in mm -hmm. Providence? And what's the worst that can happen? You come back. Mm -hmm. And she says, "You're the only one of all my friends that encouraged me. You got to follow your dreams." And um. And so, and then, you know, time goes by, you know, I have my children and you know, ups and downs in the life, and blah, blah, blah. And then I get to a point in life where I'm like, I want something different. And I said, well, maybe I'll just move to Boston. At, you know, in 2012, I decided that I wanted to go live in Boston. I wanted um, the economy and things in, in, Rhode, in Rhode Island wasn't wasn't that good um, job prospects um, I was like I'm not gonna be able to find what I need here let me just go so I, I, I came here I struggled for a couple of years I, I met my uh, my late husband and uh, I lived I lived in, in downtown Boston in a, in a, in a single occupancy um, room and what it meant was I, I rented a room, but I shared common space. And then I, I, met, I met my late husband, and he moved me out to Dor Dorchester. And yeah, and that, that, was, that was it. <laughs> yeah, and now, now, now we're getting into somewhat uh, of the, of, of mm. no, I was going to say the meat of the interview, but it's not. I mean, it, it, all of it, it matters, right? Mm -hmm. All of it matters to the person that you are, to the identity that you have, et cetera. But... Uh, the time in Dorchester and your experiences there leading up to your decision to yes. move to Arlington, which again was a very clear yes. and, um, and, deliberate. and deliberate and, you know, probably not fully supported in the same way as Maria, you know, it struck me that you were saying that your friend Maria told you that you were the only person who supported her idea about leaving. Yeah. I, I imagine you didn't have much support for the idea of you leaving. You know. I got a lot of questions, like, what, why? And after I um, talked to a few people about moving, um, I said to myself, <laughs> just don't talk about it, just go. Mm. Yes, and you found out that there's a whole movement no, no, that but that was then. I didn't really, you know, back in 2012, going from oh, I from see. Providence Just, I see. from Providence to coming to Boston, gotcha. it, it was a lot of it was my family. And then, why am I? I'm, you know, so I, I just I just left, and um, I, I came here. I started off from like nothing. I worked. I like I said, I met my late husband, and um, 
we decided to join the, um, the Nation of Islam. And that was an experience. Um, I learned quite a bit being a part of that organization uh, and where it was located in like the epicenter of, of those three boroughs. Um, yeah, just be Grove, Grove Hall. Right. Between, so between Roxbury, Roxbury, Roxbury Dorchester, Dorchester, and Madison. Madison. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Blue Hill Avenue runs through all of it. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a lot of, oh, we did a lot of work. We, um, what we did, we did like street vending, but it was legitimate. We had the, the license and the support, and we worked under an organization called One Day Boston. And um, like once a month, or it was seasonal, we did Christmas, uh, Christmas time, in the springtime, in the summertime. They organized bazaars um, with other um, small or micro micro businesses. Oh, I, we used to call them street vendors. Um, there was one event at the the Bo Bruce Bolin Building, and then there was another event um, during Kwanzaa, and we did a lot of like you know sa sales, and we made some we made some some good pocket money. We took vacations and we went to um, we celebrated our anniversaries, and we went to Myrtle Beach, and uh, we went down to Cape, and we've been to Newport, and we just enjoyed, you know, being being a couple. Mm -hmm. But it that was a beautiful thing, but I had a hard time making friends, you know, um, woman to woman making friends, because I don't have the history of, you know, drug abuse. I don't have the history of coming coming out of um, the street in certain ways and a lot of things I just I just didn't do and I just wasn't into but there were a lot of things that I did like to do that I was into that wasn't relatable mm -hmm. you know and and then trying to get involved with the struggle or community activism you had to be careful mm. because what I found was you know People have these bright ideas to get groups of people together, to organize, to, 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 to get funds for starting their own nonprofit agencies. And then when they do get where they are, get what they want, they start pushing away people who have helped them. Mm. So you be feeling used and um, feeling used by certain organizations, um, not really getting along with, with my peers as, as, a, as a woman because um, the things that I enjoy doing, they, they really weren't into. I, wa I wanted to go to museums, I wanted to go to plays, um, I wanted to travel, and like, why do you want to do all that? That's, 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 that's white people stuff. You want to do things that white people mm. want to do. I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't want to spend every weekend in the park, you know, barbecuing. You know, and then, then also as converting to Islam to, in, to some degree, you know, my diet changed. So a lot of foods that are popular soul foods. I don't eat them, mm -hmm. you know. And so when I show up, they're like, "Oh, well, yeah. well we made this and that. Now, are you going to join us?" I'm like, "No, I'll just have a, a portion of this. The other stuff, I, I can't, I can't eat. It's, it's, it's a di I'm on direct dietary restriction." And you get all the, you know, the heavy breathing, the sighs, like, <sighs> yeah. You know? so and, and and then being called because I was a member of the Nation of Islam, being called, well, you're not even a real Muslim. Those are fake Muslims. That's, that was also a charge that you had to deal with? Was, <laughs> there was that Nation of Islam is not you real they, Muslims? No, they, 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 those are not even real Muslims. Those, they, those are fake Muslims. I was like, okay. But also I had my experience within the nation, and I started to see that maybe I wasn't being taught what I want to know and understand of what Islam is. So I, I, I struggled with that. I took the hijab off, I put it back on, I took it off and put it back on. And mm. I, then I just said, oh, that's enough. I don't, I don't, you know, and, but then I missed my evolving relationship with God as I understood him and as I'm taught to call him Allah. And uh, so this past January, I sought out information about um, a mosque at Roxbury Crossing. Gotta go back to the hood, you know, sometimes <laughs> to get to get what you need. <laughs> and um, the big, the Islamic Society of Boston Cult Culture Center, and I sat down and spoke with the imam, and 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 I made my decision to take my shahada, 
with that community and I've done so and I just did it January 19th and I've learned so much. They put me in the uh, beginner's class. It was like, you know, Islam 101. Mm -hmm. It was like a throwback to my days of going to CCRI. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, I was learning, you know, the, the, what the five pillars are, um, the history of the prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. And now we're in, now we're in the season of Ramadan. And I've, and I've been to the mosque for Juma prayer. And I really enjoyed it. And as and I had a similar experience with a, with another former member of the nation that's well known, uh, Malcolm Malcolm X. I've been in a masala with my my Muslim sisters, all different shades of humanity, standing there in our colorful hijabs, you know, making salat. And I said, Yeah, this is this is this is this is it. This is it. This is it. You know, and now, now in. And when you say this is it, uh -huh. what I hear from what you were describing before, when you were first in Rhode Island, in fact, mm -hmm. even and then when you moved up here, and all the ways in which you couldn't connect mm -hmm. through your interests, through your diet, etc., you just couldn't connect with, mm -hmm. with you know, a lot of the women around you, etc. What was it? What 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 are you talking about when you say this is it? Um, the, the camaraderie, I didn't really know, I don't really know the women in that, in that mosque, but there was one sister that was, well, that she, she was my witness when I took my shahada, that's the declaration of my faith. Um, she gave me some instructions, we exchanged phone numbers, she contacts me sometimes, you know, inviting me to come to the mosque, I said, I'll be there, you know, on so-and-so day, and other sisters, you know, we're, we all wear hijab. And we're all different shades. So, but that doesn't stop a sister from speaking to me in her language. Mm. And I know she's just speaking to me. She's, she says, assalamu alaikum, alaykum salam. She may say a few other words. She's just encouraging me to be there. Mm -hmm. You know, you, mm -hmm. you nod your head politely. Then mm -hmm. there are those that do speak, speak English. And you have, a, you have a brief conversation with them. And, and understanding where to go to, to make, you know, to make Wudu, like it's the absolution, um, and to where to go to, you know, to the, the 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 sister's prayer room, and understanding that you know you put your you put your 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 shoes and your coat here, and you come come in here, and you you sit here, and this is where you line up on the rug to 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 make the salat, and it kind of brought me back to Worcester for a moment, mm -hmm. the diversity. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, and, and also what I hear is, mm -hmm. is, is that you're saying that f for years you, like you being yourself and you having an entree into the wider, uh, you know, culture of the, of the area you were living in w was difficult. There were, there were obstacles to that and there was an attitude that you confronted that didn't that that said that's not worth that's not worth it. That's yeah, not worthwhile. yeah. Um, as you know, I I knew I'd get divert, so I, I kind of wrote some things down. And mm -hmm. um, you know, this is this is me. I says I'm I'm black with mixed race heritage. The response from the collective is, you're black. Period. Just stop acting weird. <laughs> and I valued education and being well behaved. And the response I, I get from the collective community was, um, you think you're better than everybody, you're a wannabe. Yeah, and you mentioned that when you first got to Rhode Island, that was that sense. Yes. But that also was strongly, I think, your experience yes. when you were living in yeah, Dorchester. In Dorchester. Yeah, in Dorchester. Mm -hmm. And um, I enjoy art and trying new things and... Um, like I said, I and then you see people respond as you're weird. I listen to all different kinds. I listen to pop music. I listen to rock. I listen to um, the blues, and uh, and I and I and I have an in-depth knowledge of different areas of music. And it, you know, and like, well, where where do you come from? What what's what's up with you? Mm -hmm. That's that's the response I get. So you you know, basically, it sounds like they couldn't deal with you just not conforming 
yes. to what they were used to. Yes. And, 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 and in and, that and, way, that sounds like a very insular, very yeah, like... Yeah, and, 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 not, and not seeking validation either. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I can be in a, a room full of people and just sit there and find some way to amuse myself and not try to seek validation or interaction with other people if I don't feel comfortable doing that. Mm -hmm. But I feel comfortable with myself and just sitting down and maybe reading something or, you know, mm -hmm. and on my phone or what have you. And that has happened often, being out with, um, with my, my late husband, dealing with family or in a social setting. And, and also, you know, even sometimes when I was with the nation at going to, to that mosque, it, I wasn't seeking anybody's validation. Mm -hmm. And it's, for someone with a personality type like mine, and I discovered that I'm an introverted, you know, person, I'm self-motivated, and I, 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 I'm more comfortable with looking inward and then coming out. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. some people are more, they, they seek to find social validation and connection and then they, they, they come back to themselves. And, and now, you know, at, you know what helped me to understand that I don't, I'm not required, is, even though all these years have passed, I'm not required to fit in. I'm not required to be a part of, of quote unquote, the black community. Even though, because in the black community, they, well, it, the collective, seems to decide who you are. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. I decide who I am. I identify myself to you, not you identify me as a member of the group. Mm -hmm. And that difference of viewpoint and of identifying that, that that's where I'm like, you know what, this is really starting to become really overbearing. And I I don't know what to do about it. And I don't I don't know what and then along comes a pandemic. Which was a turning point for you, I know. Yeah. And um, you know what? Interestingly enough, that we're going to have to take up that topic and everything that comes after it, and there's a lot to that in the second half of our conversation. We're gonna take a break right now and we will return to talk about Joanne's uh, in kind of journey through the pandemic, but also uh, discovery of uh, something called divestment, which has a particular, uh, particular meaning in this context. And I wanna really delve deeply into that with you, but we'll take a break and yes, come back and certainly. have a second part of the conversation. Yes, thank you. Thank you.